we're very happy tonight to um, have an artist talk by Chase Clayton. And we have a surprise guest as well for you, Bavisha Panchia, the curator of the exhibition For the Record. And I'm just going to hand over to her now to give a little introduction. Oh, wow. OK? Thank you. Am I plugged in? Oh, <laughs> here we go. Um, I wish I could be there with you, but unfortunately, I'm in Johannesburg in kind of a winter situation. Um, so let's first say I'm really happy that we could bring Jace to come and do the talk here this evening. And also just, uh, Jace, thanks for also participating in the exhibition. Um, uh, we featured uh, his project Sufi Plugins, which is an ongoing project, uh, which you'll see on the is it left or right. Um, yeah, so yeah, I met Jace in 2015, I think, while I was doing my thesis research um, uh, for CCS, the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. And since then, I've been following his work. And that was also the moment that I became deeply invested and interested in the plugin as a tool, as an instrument. Um, I was really challenging, I guess, the Western limitations of what gets produced and you know, how things circulate. Um, Jace is also the author of this book, Uproot. Uh, which you can find in the listening space. Um, for those who don't know, he's a DJ, he's a writer, an artist, a composer, and uh, whose work kind of lies at the intersection of sound, memory, and global music culture. Um, yeah, that's going to be the brief intro. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Nicola, Christina, Alia, Ev, and Matthias for kind of handling everything in lieu of my absence. And Jace, um, really looking forward to you sharing your research and uh, current kind of ideas. Yeah. I would do the sound switcher. I'm just going to turn her to you. <laughs> So Bavisha will look at my belly, and, and I will look at you, and somehow this loop will be completed. Yeah, so as she mentioned, so I'm Jace Clayton, um, as Bavisha mentioned, and I'm going to talk briefly about this project, which you can see over here, called Sufi Plugins. Um, but more generally, I think I'm going to discuss some of the ideas ooh, and that, it, that it brought up with me, which have to do with how, how we remember things, basically, how things, how pieces of art, objects, sound, ideas enter into the historical record. So yeah, this Sufi Plugins project, it is basically something he did several years ago. I was working with um, a bunch of Moroccan musicians in Barcelona, where I lived. And so initially, I said, oh, I'm going to make um, a bunch of these digital music making tools um, so I can interact with Abdel Haq Rahal, a violinist, um, to interact with him in a more natural and fluid way. Um, and then as the project went along, I very really quickly realized, I said, oh, you know, these tools don't just need to be for me. Um, what if I were to make them public? Um, and, and I started thinking about that when I realized um, that software tools, one of the, they do many things, but one of the things they do is document a sense of what is possible. You know, and so, of course, explicitly, software does that by its functions, what you can manipulate, what you can adjust, what you can save. Um, but then they do that implicitly by the type of gestures you bring to the interface, by the languages that are there, by the sort of default behavior in the software, by all the ways in which software teaches you how to use it, and by all the ways in which software sort of trains its beliefs into your skin. And so with Sufi plugins, you know, I was making things like synthesizers that were hardwired to North African musical scales, um, strange drum machines and things like that. But I said, if I make this free and public, I can focus on this second use of, of how softwares document the possible, this sort of implicit use. And just for a quick reference, this is the kind of average uh, virtual keyboard, this is what they look like, you know, very rectilinear, gray scales, lots of hard angles, everything labeled attack, decay, sustain, release. And it, 
As an alternative, this is what one of the Sufi plugins virtual synthesizers looked like. And I like to say that everything is clearly labeled. Um, it just happens to be labeled in, um, in Amazir, in the Berber language, using the script called Neotifinar. Here's one of the drum machines in it. And so with this, I was thinking of, you know, when software has a kind of uh, hostility to the sense of a historical record, software and apps, they're, they're updating, they're, they're, they're all about the present. And so it's really hard to think about the ways in which they encapsulate memory. Um, but with Sufi plugins, I said, I don't just want to focus on sort of alternative usage, enabling that, but I want to really have that happening at the level of the interface. And so what better way than to use, you know, it's kind of an homage to my work with Moroccan musicians, so what better way than to use um, this language of Amazir, which in the sort of the broader context, there's all about, there's been a long-standing struggle that's both pro-democracy, but also about getting Amazir culture circulating in public spaces in Morocco, in public discourse. And so I said, well, what if this snapshot, what if this software, in my very personal way, snapshots some of these pressures that are brought to bear on this musical universe? And here's just a little clip so you can hear what one of these synthesizers sounds like and sort of see it happen in action. <laughs> And there's a clapping drum machine, there's a drone machine. And one of the, the sort of most uh, poetic um, of the plugins is one called Devotion. And I mean, it's a long story went into its, to its development, but basically with Devotion, you set your location on a global map, and then you set your belief level. Agnostic, observant, fervent, apostate, devout. You know, atheism is not an option. Um, but then, five times a day, out of respect for the Muslim call to prayer, it will slowly lower the volume of your computer for two or three minutes and then slowly raise it up again. And the amount it's lowered by is, of course, based on your belief level. And then another way I started thinking about, well, what, how much can I, how much of my thoughts and ideas can I put into this software? Um, I realized that this is, this is a shot within Ableton Live. And basically, every time you use the mouse to roll over a button or a knob or a fader, um, you can have a tooltip pop up. And usually, with, with software programs, a tooltip will say, you know, 23% reverb or something very, you know, volume amount. But with, with Sufi plugins, I went through and took all these excerpts of Sufi poetry, little fragments from 13th century Persia on down to the 70s. And so they are what you're seeing. They're the only sort of English language text you get as you operate throughout the software and go around moving it. So it's just another way of putting, it's both a sort of encouragement to the user to, to be open to different types of inspiration as they're using it, um, to move away from the harsh literality of digital music making spaces, but then also a kind of homage to, to all these generation of Sufi poets who are engaged with verse, and so much of that verse was thinking about music and its relationship to a sense of the self. But, but a similar project, or a related project, at least in my mind, is what I was up to the last time I was in Berlin which was here in January, um, performing the Julius Eastman Memorial Dinner um, as part of the CTM Festival. And this is a photo we took um, at a show in Holland recently. But the Julius Eastman Memorial Dinner, it's, you know, hour-long performance for grand, it's a typical setup, two twin grand pianos, electronics, um, voice, and video. And it's something I first started developing seven years ago. And then five years ago, we released an album and began touring it. But of course, the inspiration for this is uh, Julius Eastman. Here's a photo of him off a of video. Um, and Julius Eastman died in 1990. He was 49. And he was a vocalist and primarily a composer, but a multi-talented musician, classically trained, and working primarily within that world of minimalism, although he collaborated with Arthur Russell and did many things. Um, but yeah, he was black, he was gay, he was not just gay, he was a leather queen who was open and proud, which was not so common in the late 60s, early 70s, especially in the classical music world. Um, and he was also kind of a jerk, you know? 
he's amazing, gifted, talented, but he was never interested in the performance of politeness. You know, he was never interested in sort of dampening any of his exuberance. Um, and by all accounts, he was kind of a difficult person to deal with. And, and this fascinated me. When I first heard about his music, I looked into it, and I learned that, you know, through at many different levels of his life and output, Eastman resisted a kind of easy historicization. You know, he had a deep ambivalence towards institutions, and sometimes it involved shooting himself in the foot. Um, but one of the ways in which this, this ambivalence and sort of anger towards institutions developed in how he would move through various scenes, never central in any one scene, but participating at multiple sites. And he was also quite suspicious of the, the archival trace, um, archival memory. Quite famously, he would lose or throw away some of his scores, many of which were incredibly complicated, full-featured um, pieces for orchestras, for multiple cellos, multiple pianos. Um, but he had this kind of irreverence towards his own trace and footprint. And so that pulled me in. And maybe the, the best example I can think of, of his, you know, his, um, what I'm calling a sort of queer black historiography that he embraced, was his use of song titles, how he would name his song titles. Um, so this is a score, you know, handwritten um, from 1979, Evil Nigger. And other titles, Eastman titles, Nigger Faggot from 1978, Crazy Nigger, If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich, Joy Boy, um, kind, of, kind of amazing. Um, and these titles, they operate as conceptual artworks. You know, of course, they, they draw attention to who can say them or who can print them. They limit where they can be performed and how they can be written about at a very real level. It's often, even nowadays, 40 years later, it can be difficult to get these in print or spoken on the radio. And they also dramatize the bodies of the players, of the people who are performing them. And in the past two or three years, Julius Eastman has had this kind of renaissance. A lot of people are discovering his music and excitedly sharing it and getting articles in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Savvy and Merz Music here in Berlin just to do a retrospective. It's relatively easy to, to hear and learn about Eastman now, but even five or six years ago, that wasn't the case. And it's due in part to just how powerful these titles, these conceptual engines were. Um, and so he was employing them in a very dramatic way, and they were successful partially because they brought him so close to historical silence. Um, so he was playing a very edgy game. Um, but back in the 70s in New York minimalism, the naming conventions were very kind of vanilla and self-referential. You know, you would have Steve Reich, music for 18 musicians. It's a piece for 18 musicians. You know, Lamont Young, the well-tuned piano. It's a piano that's been tuned with just temperament, and he's performing it. John Cage, 433, four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. So Eastman was saying, no, 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 no. Um, these titles aren't about shock, per se, but they are laughing and poking fun at the very idea of a kind of, um, of a kind of pure formalism or a neutral aesthetic. He was going against these naming names and titles that were the equivalent of the white box, the sort of quote unquote neutral space of the gallery. And he was effectively, he was saying, you know, it's these, you know, I like to think of this work by Christine Sun Kim in the back, um, a piece I love uh, with heat wallpaper in this format, but here is scratched out and listen is left open. And, and for me, this kind of gets at the heart is what's happening at these titles. Eastman was saying to me that this idea of you can hear something, you can just get sound and interpret it, that doesn't exist. You know, there is no kind of playing position from what you, what you're, where you're going to experience sound and think about sound. All sonic engagement with the world requires listening, and listening brings in all the prejudices and the reference and the weirdness to bear. And precisely by putting titles that foreground that, he was saying, you know, listening is an act of relation. It's a, it's a relational act thing, first and foremost. And only after we admit our own prejudices and our own inability to hear can we start to think about how we might begin to listen. 
And in fact, partly this attitude is responsible for um, a, a very kind of famous fallout he had with John Cage, who was just saying to Eastman, like, you are too explicit with all of these things. Some things are better left in the closet in so many words. But here, I'll play a little clip of our, the performance from, from January that we did here. stole it from somebody on Instagram, so you only get 60 seconds. <laughs> um, but I wanted to show you, to give you an idea of what it sounds like, I'm mean, going to kind of walk through my thinking behind it. Um, I mean, the piece involves all sorts of things. You know, at some point, I get interviewed via Skype for a job as a Julius Eastman impersonator. Things happen. There's our own music. Um, but at the core of the Eastman Memorial Dinner, um, we do perform Gay Gorilla and Evil Nigger. But as I was thinking about Eastman's sort of hostility towards entering into histories in an untroubled way, I thought to myself, you know, and I was so excited back when I began to sort of spread the gospel of Eastman. I'm like, everybody needs to hear this music. It's so fantastic. It's in line with my work as a DJ, sort of looking for sounds and recontextualizing them. But I. I don't want to do a remix. It's not about adding a beat or sampling or something like that. No, that sort of paradigm of the remix, it's all about a postmodern fluidity, which is great. It's all about the contemporary, but that doesn't get at the core of, of what I found so engaging about his work. And at the same time, you know, a handful of classical music presenters had put, put on Eastman projects um, then, but in 2011, and I said, you know, that's not quite right either. Um, the classical music paradigm of having virtuoso players follow his scores faithfully doesn't really feel right. It brings up these ideas of lineage and revival and sort of the, the careful selection of talent that Eastman was also pushing against. Um, but I knew I wanted to work with it. And so the ultimate sort of configuration that I came up with is what you heard in the clip. Um, pianists Emily Manzo and David Friend, they're sort of faithfully performing these, these long works um, in full. And I don't know if you can see there, but like right at the top it says 1.30, and then down there it's 1.50, you know, and it's referring to the minute and the seconds. And so this is like a 28-minute piece, a 23-minute piece. And throughout the score, Eastman would have all these tiny indications for like, this needs to happen exactly at 1735, things like that. Um, so part of his image is this sort of disheveled man, and drug problems and homelessness. But as a composer, he was actually incredibly precise. And, and this, this, these are pieces for multiple instruments. So Emily and David are, you know, world-class pianists, and they're performing these pieces very much uh, following Eastman's original scores and really trying to do that um, in a way that honors them. But at the same time, I've got a microphone in each piano, and I'm taking a feed from the microphone into the laptop. And I'm using some of the Sufi plugins software, and I'm using some other kind of music devices to push and transform and mutate um, and kind of mess up and interrupt the, the stream of sound. And so there are no samples involved. It's all happening real time. And I think of it as a kind of, you know, this was originally performed by Eastman and three others on four grand pianos. And so as I think about the Eastman, Julius Eastman Memorial Dinner, I'm like, okay, this is my um, thinking of Eastman as a problem. Thinking of Eastman as someone who was 
putting kinks and ruptures um, into how music moves forward, how music enters, you know, how music gets discussed and, and kind of canonized. Um, this is my way of, of enacting that or continuing those issues. So hopefully what you get when you see the Julius Eastman Memorial Dinner is a kind of site of multiple layers of listening. You know, it's possible almost to focus in and only hear the pianos as they're doing his original scores, but the electronics are diving in and out. They're, in, they're playing with it. They're tossing with it. It's improvised. It's always changing. Um, and so that was my way to kind of bring, make audible all those, all those um, frictions within Eastman's work. And so when I think about him, I also think about another New York City conceptualist, Mrs. Lee Lozano. It was a photo from the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and she was, I mean, she was amazing, a huge inspiration, but like Eastman, very, um, walking a very powerful and almost scary line that had to do with the agency of self-destruction. And so this is a notebook page, you know, from 1968. I've started to document everything because I cannot give up my love of ideas. The next year, she began something called General Strike Peace, and this basically continued until the end of her life. And it's related general strike piece and then dropout piece are her saying, like, this is my new artwork. I'm going to slowly withdraw from the art world. I'm going to document the last few shows I participated in. And, you know, she was friends with Richard Serra and, I mean, all the, the big conceptualists, all the big sculptures, all the big people of those times. She knew them and she was part of it, but she said, I'm going to leave and that's going to be my work. And then in 1972, she did an equally sort of troubling and challenging piece called Decide to Boycott Women. And so she's like, I'm going to decide to stop talking with women, period. And she did this for the next 30 years of her life. Um, so by the late 70s, she had left New York City, was moving back in Texas, but she kept general strike peace, dropout speech, dropout peace, and decision to boycott women active. Um, kind of amazing. And amazing because like Eastman, Lee Lozano just presents us with a problem. You know, there are no solutions here. But she is saying, you know, I feel like both of their work, um, it asks us to consider, I mean, they're occupying extremes, but they're asking us to consider, well, how do you present yourself to the world? Um, what sort of control do you have or don't you have in terms of who writes about your work, who positions your work, where can it travel? Um, what does agency look like in an extremely complicated system of honor and rumor and money and capitalism and patriarchy? And then they're both going, you know, you've got your evil niggers over here, you've got your boycotted women over here. They're really kind of applying pressure at these pressure points. And Eastman's having a bit of a revival, but Lee Lozano, they're still very kind of um, liminal figures overall pushing against this idea of an easy visibility. And all this to me, one of the things that I'm, that I'm going back to them now in this moment is because, we'll skip here, we're in a, a very odd moment um, where there's a kind of rush to visibility happening. And of course, um, from a music, music angle, um, there's things like Spotify, various streaming services, YouTube, these moments of basically corporate archives that are taking the wealth of recorded music and artistic production, stripping it of metadata, stripping it of the year the album was recorded, who was performing on it, taking away all these things, making the artwork this big, um, and selling it back to us. Um, and so that's very troubling. But then there's also, there's also this rush to visibility um, I'm a part of it, you're a part of it. It has to do with how, we, how much time we spend sort of producing ourselves for social media platforms, you know, taking the selfie, putting the quote on Twitter, Facebook, um, performing whoever we envision ourselves as for our friends or for these communities, but on, on corporate-owned platforms that do not have our best interest in mind. And even that has a sort of corollary with this moment of kind of increased attention to identity politics. This idea that, um, 
one must sort of clearly state who they are, put down their position, and then that will make other aspects of their life or their practice or their, or their community somehow get it, become crystallized. Um, and so all these, all these moments make me think of, well, what are some of the alternatives to this? Um, and I go back to Eastman and Lozano because they help me think about, like, well, let's take, what's the sort of dramatic opposite to what we're seeing now? And these two images of Lozano, I should also mention the spam archive. I just, today, I was putting together these, these slides, you know, Lee Lozano, Google image search. And very close to the top were these sort of automated Amazon, you can buy the book, but if it was a shirt, like this is, this is what the dimensions are gonna be like. And then this weird, super spammy one, which has squashed her, <laughs> um, almost beyond recognition, clink, link, in description to download this book. Um, so I feel like, despite all of her Betty efforts to, to attenuate and guide her withdrawal from the art world, she's, it's too late. She's already in the image machine. She's already being used to both sell the book, which is quite thoughtful, um, but then just pull her into like, you can, you know, the, the Viagra spam. The, so it's, it's a strange model. Um, but, but with Spotify, um, you know, oftentimes when people talk about the, sort of those types of platforms, or things like Red Bull Music Academy, where it's long, very thoughtful articles on under-acknowledged aspects of music culture paid for by this right-wing Austrian energy drink company. Um, with, with situations like that, um, oftentimes, especially with Spotify, the, the dialogue is, okay, streaming, are musicians getting paid? The metadata's gone, this is a problem. Um, and I'm very, I believe in that and I agree with it. But somehow thinking of this, the world of Eastman, I'm like, you know, we can't just, the archive doesn't end there. And so I'm really interested in how artists can, can kind of activate the archive by freaking it, by bending it, by doing weird things with it. And it's actually, you know, shout out to Slavs and Tatars, it's actually something you get a bit more with visual art, certain types of public practices where people are thinking about how can we reinv reinvigorate the text but avoid both the remix and the classical representation. Um, but in music, it's almost not there. And I'm thinking actually very basic levels. Like at Spotify, you know, say, you know, DJ ruptures Spotify, you can listen to everything you want, but maybe if you're gonna listen to Beethoven, you couldn't listen to any single track individually. You have to listen to all movements of a specific concerto at the same time. Like this. <laughs> single artist with every track at once. Um, or, you know, maybe you could do things like, well, it would actually be engaging for people to listen to my mixes in chronological order. And maybe you could only access them one at a time in chronological order. Who knows what? Um, the point is, uh, it's very important to, to think and imagine um, the artistic output is not merely being, this is a track I made, this is a weird plug-in, but this is, how, this is how it's going to be, can be handled and touched, and this is who can deal with it and reach it and think about its existence, not only as something that leaves your studio and floats off into the world, but to think of it as a, a long-term a long -term practice, you know, as long as Lee Lozano's dropout piece, which lasted basically the entirety of her life. But I have to mention this because this went up today on Red Bull Music Academy. The songbook showdown of Julius Eastman and John Cage, remembering an incendiary performance by the radical composer that shook up the avant-garde. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's like a fact-checked fact, fact -checked article, um, but it is so strange and disconcerting to think of uh, wretched energy drinks supporting this type of thing. And suddenly it's cartoons and it's a face-off and it's creating a weird binary. Um, specifically, and so much, um, so much would change if, uh, there, let's just say there are many other ways to, to present and to remember and to recollect and to share our own memories and engagements. Now I'm gonna to sort of close by taking a step to the side and discuss 
and discuss trap music, which is to say to discuss the sonic neighbor of a lot of these ideas that I've been talking about, the sort of how it, how it manifests as a listening experience. Um, and, you know, Outcast, famous classic Outcast album. And I show this slide because this is the first, uh, this is the first mention of trap in, in rap lyrics. Um, and so nowadays, you, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll play it. Here we go. This is Spody Odie Dopalicious, an amazing, maybe the best humanist rap song. Can't gamble feeding baby on that dope money. Might not always be sufficient. But the United Parcel Service and the people at the post office didn't call you back because you had cloudy piss. So now you're back in a trap. Just that. Trap. trap, trap. Go on to marinate on that for a minute. mid-90s, you've got the sort of dub reggae horns giving a nostalgic feel and throwing back. And the whole song is this beautiful sort of realist, socially aware, but not cheesy or didactic take on a sort of, on a moment in this guy's life, on a scene in a club, a fight breaks out. And he, here, you know, he's like, you got kicked out of your job because you were tested for drugs and they saw that you'd been, you know, that you'd been taking drugs and now you're back in a trap. A trap is a house where drugs are made or sold. He was trapped. So it's this idea of the trap as a, trap as a jail. And, and then fast forward 20 years and trap is the name of this very, very exciting new genre in hip hop um, called trap. And the genre has one rule and that rule is you must rap about breaking the rules. You must rap about your criminal activities and behaviors. If you don't honestly do them, you need to invent them. Um, so it's gone a million miles from the sort of heartfelt outcast thing to this, this, these narratives of kind of speaking the unspeakable. You know, you have to embrace all the fucked up evils of capitalism, selling people, selling drugs, community self-destruction, um, and, that's, and that's the trap. And on the same day that you know, Kanye West was the whole like slavery was a choice with his Trump hat. Um, one of my favorite trap artists, Zero Three Greedo, was actually charged, um, sentenced to 20 years in jail. And this is from a Fader, shout out to Ruth, Fader headline, Greedo and his 20 year sentence, this is a trap. But I mention all of this, this sort of little mini history of, oops, of trap, um, because it sounds amazing. Um, it's a completely like anti-nostalgic music and bass does really incredible things in trap music that I think are related to all of this. Um, and when we talk about like the low, the low, the low bass frequencies, they're the really long sound waves. You know, like a high-pitched sound wave is gonna be very, very small, but bass are literally long. And so you need a lot of power just to generate bass. You need a big amplifier, you need a subwoofer. Um, and what that means is that, quite literally, bass is the most sort of material moving frequency of, of sound. Um, and what it means to us as listeners is that if your neighbor is bumping trap or techno or anything with a really solid low end, you're probably gonna hear it coming through the wall. It's probably going to interrupt your personal space with their shitty music. Um, but you won't really hear the highs, you mostly just get that you mostly just get that bass. Um, and music is, a, of course, it's a way of engaging and creating and sustaining communities, um, but it's also a way of like pissing off those around you or announcing your membership of a community as you move through the city, you know, in a car or whatever. And so that's one of the really fascinating things about trap music is that the bass, it's, it's very low, um, and it's very sort of pure. It's very sort of sine wavy. It's not like a, like a dubstep, wah, 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 high end bass that can be heard on, on little laptop speakers. Um, no, Trap's bass, it has this very unusual mirroring of what you could call a kind of like a black ontology, you know? And so there's this idea of the, the black body. It's marked politically, it's marked artistically, it's marked legally. And those markings, and it's funny, and then also marked with the writing on his own face. 
but all of those, all of those markings make it, um, it's both the sort of blackness as a mask, you can, any individuality can disappear, um, and blackness as a problem, that's all happening. Um, it's either too much or too little. And the presence or absence of bass and trap music, I think, is a reflection and extension of this condition. Um, but for, for a little bit of grounding, let's listen to, um, to a song that I first heard circulating in the cars um, and being played on public speakers in New York City. This is Cardi B's Bodak Yellow, major hit. This is from Instagram. And of course, she's also referencing this, like, the presence is, the absence is a lie. He's not in college, he's in jail. But anyhow, this is Bodak Yellow, and of course, the bass is what I'm interested in. So I wanted to play that snippet because the bass is doing very unusual things. Um, first off, you know, earlier today I was playing this on my laptop speakers, completely gone. You didn't hear a thing. But put this in a car, put this in a big club, and it becomes huge. Um, but the bass is furtive. It's barely there. It's not really marking time, like like bass in many songs. It's not holding down a rhythm section. Um, in fact, it sort of moves between bass as a percussive kick drum and bass as a little bit of melody. It's somewhere between a percussive gesture and a lyrical phrase. Um, so it just has, it's there mostly just to be itself, and within that it's barely there. Um, and so to me it's an iconic song for many reasons. I mean, Cardi B is incredible, but the way it's operating sonically brings to bear all of these strange histories of incarceration, of disappearance, of what does it mean to be too present and over-policed? What does it mean to have to hide your history or your story? Or conversely, to have to dramatize it and perform it for others. Um, all of that, all those strange tensions, you know, private pleasures, public outcries, it's all wrapped up in quite literally how the bass is moving through us and uniting us, often whether or not we want to be united by it or not. So I think that's a good place to pause and then we can talk and take questions. And thank you. Adding on to your thoughts about like frequencies and trap music, um, just want to share really quickly. I have this experience. I've lived in New York for like the last seven years, New York City, and I had this experience, this really like memorable, memorable, clear experience, like about a year or two ago, like riding the subway, and there were like all these dudes around me, like you know, tough New York dudes with like headphones on, and like literally it was like silent in the train except for like. All I could hear was like the clicks of the hi hats, just like <laughs> of like the trap sort of like thirty second note hi hat. Um, I was just thinking like you know like the the human hearing is more res like receptive to like higher frequencies, mm -hmm. and like the subs of like bass don't really translate to like earbuds and stuff. Um, it was almost like kind of like illustrative to me of like the process of like trap kind of moving out away from like where it started becoming, now it's basically like a, its own like SoundCloud genre kind of mm -hmm. production thing. It was just like, it was just kind of funny to think about like, you know, hi-hats being, carrying this like really like sort of like 
tough, like, sort of power, like, that the bass usually does, but it doesn't really work. You know, it was kind of funny. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And especially that, the thing, it's like, as the sounds get lower in frequency, we lose our sense of directionality. You know, like, that's why dogs freak out with thunder. And so it's, it's precisely the moment when the sound sensation turns closest into, like, a physical embodied sensation. You feel it in your stomach. Um, but also means that, like, we are, as listening bodies, are our directionality is confused. Like if you only hear the bass, you don't really know where it's coming from. You only know if it's coming closer to you or further away from you. So again, it highlights this kind of intense relationality. Um, but the, you say trap has now moved into this weird sound cloud world, and it's, it's, which is accurate. Um, and so I would claim that one of the reasons that it's this very interesting, which I think you know, my thoughts on what bass is doing, I'm like, actually, it's this weird, I think that's part of what's propelling it. It's the sheer sonics of it. Like the lyrical content will drift off as it goes into like Italian trap or German trap or Casablanca trap or whatever. But still that, these sort of positionings of high and low and the way it like messes with public space, amplification, studio, I think are all quite present in its, as it internationalizes. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, about about Eastman's type, song titles, mm -hmm. I, I tend to like, not necessarily disagree, but sort of like trying to like, like add to what you were, what you were saying, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, I think another way of sort of like seeing the relationship between the song titles and the, and the sort of like pieces that he sort of like wrote and contributed mm -hmm. is that with the titles, he actually sort of like put he puts meaning in these abstract forms, mm -hmm. but but it's not arbitrary because once you once you hear you hear like imagine so you hear the sound and then you say mm, what am I listening to and you go to the title and you read the title and then you go back to the music then then you totally like literally see the link like say in in Evil Nigger mm -hmm. the title once you go back to it you totally see why this piece is not just like oh I'm going to call it that because because minimalist music misses that. Whereas mm -hmm. if you call a Philip Glass piece like like, a, like, 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 like Evil Nigger, it won't work. <laughs> because it's just, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not that. So I think there, there, is a, there is a relationship there between, uh, I don't know, like the classic concept of form and content, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he reconfigures this by these titles. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is, I was wondering about your opinion. So like, I'm sure you're aware of Kanye West's like, work. In the last few albums, he's been doing something. I, I mean, he probably, you, you can say he did it from the very beginning, right? But say, for instance, in the new album with Ghost Town, mm -hmm. or like what he did with like the, the last track, the last track of the first release of uh, Life of Pablo where he reconfigures a couple of very well-known uh, house, early house tracks, right? It's somewhere, it's somewhere, you can't really call it remix, mm -hmm. but you can't really call it what you're doing, but it's somewhere in between mm -hmm. where like he uses this sort of like our memory of a remix mm -hmm. to really does what you're doing, but to the person who doesn't know, it still sounds like a remix, but actually he's not remixing. I don't know if, if yeah. you're familiar with, 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 with the old track that he picks up and redoes mm -hmm. in as Ghost Town, which yeah. is like the best track from the new album. Yeah, yeah, and that's great. I mean, to, quick, quickly, with the first one, I think Eastman titles are also part of his practice of, he was very interested in these sort of like uh, inversions, you know? So like in the middle of Gay Gorilla, the Martin Luther hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, so that's Gay Gorilla, and the titles sort of do that. He's all about like sacred, secular, like kind of fuck them together and where do, where do you emerge? But yeah, the second, um, yeah, Kanye West, it's, it's a, uh, it is, uh, he is, he remains a very intriguing figure um, for many of the, like his, it's, and for sometimes I was like, oh, he just bought that Nina Simone sample as a luxury item. You know, like you, you, we know you paid six, six figures for that, and that's terrible. But uh, there are these really great moments where he's doing very strange sampling, even more recently, so where his artistic process keeps on going. And I was actually, this other funny thing is that last time I was here, I ended up um, at Kanye West's suite in some private hotel. And in order to enter in and like hold, you know, 
I, I had to leave my telephone and sign a, a legal agreement to not discuss what was going on inside, a non-disclosure agreement. And I'm like, oh, this is, has something to do with historiography, but it's also very corporate. And it's also maybe the most interesting thing about the gathering was the fact that I had to commit it to silence to excise it from a public record. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So in 15 years, the Berghain's going to come with the seven-page non-disclosure agreement where, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I wanted to ask you maybe about, because we have had Whitney oh. half <laughs> singing at us quite a few times, and what's something you were talking about, um, about memory and about um, artists um, trying in some way to direct the flow of their creative output by maybe limiting access or trying to hide or sometimes intentionally being hidden or not being hidden or etc and I was thinking about Whitney because um, obviously there's a new documentary and I read a really great criticism today by Simran Hans about um, the new documentary that's about to come out um, but it was talking made some great, great points about the way that the film minimized her voice and tried to wow. like overlay its own meanings into like, like the kind of whoop at the beginning of I want to dance with somebody and kind of like framing it within a, you know, advertising money, like hit, hit, just flattening them, like her meanings. And I was thinking then again about how media can get in the way of listening. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered what your thoughts on that and the way that already what prejudice is that that is um barriers is putting up in yeah. front of our listening yeah it's it's huge because on the one hand music it like enters into us at such a personal level like if you have a connection with whitney houston it's probably formed the 80s or 90s and it's gonna be a lot to you and and the documentary won't change that um, but at the same time uh we're in this moment when things are actually more visual than ever before, so more mediated first by the visual and away from the oral, which I think is a huge loss. Um, and it does become much, much harder to, to really sit down and listen to something. You know, the, the, you're hyper aware of how you come to a certain track or how you stumble upon, so, like there's no more, ser serendipity is a very rare thing. And so on the one hand, these patterns of like access and distribution, like, oh, Cardi B, she's an Instagram star turned rapper, and all these things are kind of great, this persona, this idea that music is one aspect of it. But I do think that it's harder in this contemporary moment to really, to kind of stay in the weirdness of, of, a, of a relatively unmediated listening experience, whether it's an old Whitney Houston record or it's some dark club and you don't know what's being played. Yeah. I think I was thinking more about like, I feel like the uh, maybe the media, as somebody who's in the media, but is 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 doing a really bad job uh, of maybe, mm -hmm. or like interfering with the way that um, maybe a legacy is seen, or mm. maybe diminishing. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I guess I'm not talking just about Whitney, but I'm just thinking about the way in which magazines and websites are staffed, and how oh, that yeah. is like potentially distorting who is getting heard or in what ways they're being hugely. heard. I mean, yeah. Hugely, I mean, hugely, hugely. And yeah, and the, the sort of the myth of the grassroots star, you know, like the viral star, not really, um, not at all. And it's both the media and in the cases of both Eastman, um, whose estate has formalized after, since I began the project and then started saying, your festival played Eastman, you owe us this amount of money, retrospective, like weird things going on those scores are no longer available online because the, the estate has taken them down. And I'm sure with Whitney Houston's estate, like Nina Simone's estate, they're like, oh, we'll agree to like the Netflix biopic, but here are certain things which can or can't be said. You know, like, to, I was like shocked and horrified to have, to see Nina Simone's abusive ex-husband like talking about her comfortably in, in the, that documentary. I was like, I haven't seen the Whitney Houston one yet. Um, but it is, there's, the, the myth is that like, oh, I follow that star on social media, like I understand them. But the actual reality has so much to do with still the, the editors, the people selecting out, the, the plus the, the closed doors algorithms and all these things. So yeah, which, and ultimately to me that actually does put the onus back on, like, well, who is your music community? Like where does your information come from? Like thinking about 
your media intake and how that, like what's, what that's supporting, yeah. even just like the sites you go to discover new stuff, yeah. So I have a question about the Sufi plugins. Um, when you're making something that exists like here as a piece in sort of a mm. visual art gallery context and then it's also in Ableton where someone could play with it, and, mm -hmm. but it's also not labeled in a way that it would be easy for them to figure out what the knobs do. Um, I'm curious, um, like I've, I've also made things in the gallery world and, and now I'm making uh, sound and music where I'm trying to figure out how to make my own instruments in mm -hmm. just because, um, but more with gear, not so much with in Ableton, because I think that I would end up with something different if I made a different instrument. Um, and so the question is like, when you make something for Ableton and people could use it, but they don't know how or whatever, um, so you're putting up this barrier. My question is like, you, you could um, say, um, you know, you don't know how to use this, hence you're gonna end up with, I don't know what, or you, I want you to end up with this kind of music because that's what the plugin does. Um, but my, my question is sort of about like, the intention of, um, do you want this to sort of infiltrate the world and people actually use it a mm -hmm. lot? And, and also, I saw you talk in January about the, um, uh, when you were here as part of CTM and you were talking about autotune and how like mm -hmm. it went from the seismic waves to, you know, through the bootlegs and then to T-Pain and wherever it is now. Yeah. Um, so autotune has, like the algorithms have their sort of life like a meme that went mm -hmm. really far. So I guess the question is like, what's the intention with this and do you intend to make things that you do want to kind of get out of hand or mm -hmm. actually be adopted versus, you know, just being in a gallery or, or whatever? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think getting out of hand is actually a great way of putting it, you know, like I love this idea of it being, um, yeah, like it's this particular one, it's very specific in terms of the pitches it can play, but you can mess around with it and have it have sound in many different ways. Um, but the fact that it's not labeled hopefully says to people, it's like, oh, you don't need to know, you know, like engagement with it, trying to foreground a sense of play and be like, I'm not an authority, <laughs> run with it. Um, and that's very interesting. And for that to actually happen, if we're talking about music software, I would need to find a generous VST coder <laughs> um, so that I could make it in a format which is more easily shared, you know. So, you know, in, in Morocco, I actually have many, I know many active musicians and have all these studio contacts, but everyone there is using Fruity Loops or Cubase, um, which, which means if I put them in a, a format like VST, it'd be, very, it'd be easy. And as soon as that happens, I'm like, yeah, I'll go back, I'll like send the CD with, pack with these, and people be thrilled. Just, you know, my friends know they exist, but they can't use them. Um, so that sort of spreadability uh, and the way that uh, the sort of, you know, that the cheapness of that media or that, that sort of meme-like quality leads to weird, weird uses is, is, is pretty exciting. It would be really interesting to kind of combat the, you know, he was saying that hi-hats are now this thing that, and, or you're saying that bass is this thing that sort of mm -hmm. rules the public space. It would be yeah. interesting to try to combat sound with making plugins so that, like, you know, you're, you're sort of shifting the percentage of certain mm -hmm. sound or rhythms or means of production mm -hmm. by making the tools so you could give them like, to, like you were saying, as VSTs. That's a really interesting conversation because right now we're talking about, you know, is it Spotify, or is it SoundCloud, is it Mixcloud, is it whatever. Yeah. Um, but if we go on a different level, which is on the level of sound, that would be like, again, taking it back to, to the music or to the sound aspect of it. Yeah. Maybe like a closing comment from, for me and then we can drink and you can come address me individually, is that like part of my hope with all this stuff is that like right now it's really easy for people to get started making music. You can do it on your phone, laptop, whatever. Um, and, and this idea of like the bootlegs and the edits and the remixes, it's a very casual environment to play with music. Um, and I hope that that sort of casual sense um, that anything is possible will extend to people thinking about instrument design and archive creation and like all the other, a or, and music journalism and like all the other aspects uh, of, you know, the ways in which we gather on music to create meaning. It doesn't need to, hopefully the, that energy can spread um, into other adjacent areas. Well, thank you, IFA Gallery. Thank you.